great number of medical schools went out of existence between 1910 and 1920. It was a very competitive time. It's interesting that in our school, which really was hampered by lack of funds, how well it, it did prepare the students for their work. Every session of the General Assembly that I'm aware of, starting in 1910 up through the early, of late 20s, maybe even 1930, uh, there was at least one representative who would introduce a bill to abolish the medical college. The First World War came in there and a lot of the faculty and the students were pulled away. That was another time when uh, it was uh, really difficult for the school to survive. Anatomy lab with all the cadavers up on the east wing upstairs and of course it was always smelled like formaldehyde. The odor was so bad when I'd ride home on a streetcar, people get up and move away, wouldn't, wouldn't sit close to me. The students learned how to reconnect a colon, how to do a skin flap or a skin graft. We think of these very sophisticated, advanced things, and yet they were part of medical education at this time. There were two independent medical colleges in the city of Little Rock. The one was affiliated with the University of Arkansas. The other was a private medical college called the Physicians and Surgeons Medical College. Abraham Flexner visited Little Rock as he visited every other site of a medical college in the United States during 1909 and 10. He then published what came to be known as the Flexner Report on Medical Education. Flexner took both schools to task. He said neither of our medical schools was really any good and the best solution that could be reached in reaction to his report was to merge the two. These two were merged in 1911. The graduating students of 1912 published a scathing uh, appeal to the Board of Trustees of the University of Arkansas in which they told all the things that were wrong over at 2nd and Sherman Street where the medical college then was. The result of it was the Board of Trustees accepted the Dean's resignation and they made Morgan Smith the Dean. Dr. Smith was one of the men who really was responsible for the school maintaining its viability and he was very successful at that. I think I've been told that that the entire budget for the medical school at that time was $50,000, which uh, is amazing when you think about the present uh, expenditures. Smith went to Governor Donaghy. He had a crisis about space and about accommodations, and the old state house came to be the home of the College of Medicine in the fall of 1912. So within two years, we had been savagely critiqued about the two medical schools. The two had been merged, the students had staged a sort of uprising, a new dean had come in, the state capitol had been finished, and it just all fit together. When the College of Medicine moved into the old state house, the place was very quickly fitted up just in a matter of some months over the summer uh, to receive the students. Uh, you see the uh, partitioning the old state house of representatives chamber. The medical school had no money to spend on maintaining the old state house. It was dilapidated, in other words, the, the uh, lecture rooms were, were old, the plaster was falling from the ceiling, it needed, needed paint badly, the chairs were, were, were been used for a long time, but even then we didn't notice those things because we were interested in what we were doing. It is not that the medical college wore out the fabric of the old state house. In fact, one could argue that without the medical college there, it well might have been sold and wrecked and we wouldn't have the building at all, or that it would have become so dilapidated that it would have collapsed and we might have seen some modern concrete thing built in its place. The medical college did not wear out the old state house's fabric, but it certainly did not restore it. The building had already housed upstairs a small state public health laboratory. That was uh, put in in order to get a grant from what became the Rockefeller Fund uh, for the eradication of hookworm and other infectious diseases. The Rockefeller Sanitation Commission decided to go after malaria and experimented in Crossit, Arkansas. 
There were ditches, there were ponds, there were little stagnant pools everywhere uh, in which the mosquitoes could breed. And um, malaria was their worst medical problem. So the, the Rockefeller public health workers began filling in ditches and they began cutting brush, they began clearing away land. They even made screens for some of the windows of the houses that people lived in. And in one year's time, they reduced the incidence of malaria by 72%. Now, this project and the results of this project in Arkansas became the international model for the Rockefeller Institute effort against malaria throughout the world. In the teens and the 20s, we are talking about the horse and buggy doctor, which we often put in parentheses and would take as a, an expression that means someone was very old fashioned. The reality was that at a time in Arkansas when automobiles were a great rarity, the horse and buggy doctor was coming to your house in a reliable conveyance that cost some money to keep up and that buggy would carry everything that a physician reasonably would need to take care of you. We're talking most medicine practiced either in the office or in house calls. I remember one doctor here, uh, Dr. Lindsay, his name was. He, uh, when cars came in, he got a car for his wife to use and for his family to use, but he kept his horse and buggy because he thought it was more dependable. Somebody called him, he wanted to be sure he could get there. If you consider the kinds of fees that physicians received, they look ludicrously low to our time. To see a physician charge a patient one dollar for an office visit. But in Arkansas, in 1910, 20, a dollar was frequently a day's wage. I remember that if you couldn't pay your doctor in dollars, <laughs> you could pay him in other things. If you had a farm, you could give him a pig or a chicken or something, and they accepted those things. The uh, early members of the faculty really kept the, the school glued together because really most of the time the school was on probation. Had it not been for those dedicated men, this school wouldn't have survived. Dr. Fulmer, Dr. Lewis, Dr. Vincent Hader, Morgan Smith certainly. Had it not been for those men, how we survived, I don't know. But it did, it did, and it's developed into a very fine institution now.